Luke. Hey, David. How are you? I'm doing good. Great to finally connect. Yeah. Sorry, it's been just a whirlwind of I, things going on. <laughs> that's so good, though. How how's your life changed in this past week? Um, a lot more uh, media and interviews than I've ever done in my life in this last week. <laughs> But other than that, still the same old me. Nice. Has, have there been any uh, big ones like outside of the surf industry? Um, yeah, I did an interview with uh, NBC Nightly News in New York, I believe they are, but just over Zoom as well. <laughs> yeah, we, we watched that show, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. when it's going to air, but it all should be out soon. First of all, I mean, congrats. It goes without saying, but hugest congrats in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I feel like we have our surf heroes and it's great to see when our heroes win, but this feels like we won. This feels like I won to a certain degree. So it's like the every man story is just amazing. That's really cool to hear. Yeah, it really does feel like, even though I had very little exposure to you prior, I think the first, um, I remember that 10 you got at that pipe event. Was it in the trials? Yes, it was in the pipe trials. Okay. And uh, and then I remember the following year, that story of you uh, making the paddle out at Waimea when guys like Kelly and Ross and maybe even John John got washed in. Um, I don't think John surfed Waimea that day. I think he was at a different outer reef. Okay. But it was, I think it was Kelly and Ross, and I forget who else was right there. Okay. But yeah, Kelly, so yeah. Bet, Kelly bet me a plate lunch that I wouldn't make it out, and then I did. <laughs> and he didn't make it? Uh, he had just gotten washed in. He's like, I don't know if you can time it right. I'll, bet, I'll, get, I'll buy you a plate lunch if you make it out. <laughs> did he ever make good on that bet? Um, <laughs> to be honest, I never got a plate lunch from him, but Ross Williams... <laughs> Gave me 20 bucks for a plate lunch. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Hopefully he paid back Ross. Um, yeah. yeah. So those, again, those are the first two times I really remember seeing you. And um, so whenever your name pops up, it's like, oh, those are my two reference points. And I didn't even realize that you had been working as a lifeguard since. So um, I guess we'll get into the origin story and how you got into lifeguarding. But let's start with Sunday. Sunday morning, you woke up. Did you know that you'd be surfing that day or were you just planning to work? What was the story? Um, I knew I was going to be surfing. I was an invitee. So I uh, I was had all my stuff ready, but I knew I had to work as well. And I knew it was going to be a really busy day. So we tried to get there early, but traffic was just crazy, crazy, crazy. First thing in the morning. I drove down with my family and we got to Foodland and traffic was not moving. So I jumped out of the car and ran to Waimea from Foodland. It's only about a quarter of a mile or so, but it took her about a half an hour to move that quarter mile to get to the parking lot. <laughs> Crazy. So what was your, uh, first of all, do you actually work at Waimea? Um, I, I'm still one of the lower guys in the seniority list, so I don't have a set tower. Okay. I, uh, I kind of just move all around on the North Shore still. Got it. So what was your schedule that day where were you supposed to be working and how are you going to fit in your heats i was scheduled to the captain told me about four or five days before to work my man because he knew it was going to be big and i guess he trusts me to be at the beaches when they're big um and then once i knew that the contest was going to run i talked to my captain i was like oh i need to make it legit so i had to use uh my vacation leave hours, a few vacation leave hours so that I wasn't surfing on the city time. I was surfing on my own time. Gotcha. And were you working in between your heats? Yeah. I, was, I don't know if you've seen some of the accidents that happened, but there was two surfers that got pretty bad cuts and I was there to get the gauze on them, stop the bleeding and then get them to, uh, a higher level of medical attention for them to be uh, treated. 
And then there's a few, there's a couple rescues, people getting washed into the river. And then there's a few big sets on the left side of the bay. People like huge waves coming up and washing through the crowd and then hitting the rocks and like making a backwash wave and almost trying to suck people into the shore break. Um, yeah, it was quite a busy day. It seems <laughs> impossible. How do you focus on an event while you're doing all of that? Yeah, I think it really helped because I'm not a very good contest surfer. I get all the butterflies and nervous and what are they doing? What am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? This and that. And well, since I was at work, it was kind of just like any other big day where I would work and then on my break, I go surf and then, yeah. So it kind of kept my mind off of the competing aspect of the contest and just there to enjoy it and have fun. Fascinating. Um, watching the event and even the replays, you were clearly on the bigger, cleaner waves that day. What was your strategy at the start of the event? And then how did you execute it? Uh, my strategy was to have fun and be safe because the waves were very dangerous that day. Um, I do have my lineups that I like to sit at that I am comfortable sitting at. And, uh, and then I see... There's a certain look to waves that I like to go on. They give you a nice entry in and hopefully they're smoother on the face <laughs> and it just seemed to work out in my advantage. And yeah. Um, it seems like the other guys out in the lineup know that spot really, really well. And they'd be looking for those waves as well. Were you sitting deeper out than any of them or what? I was actually sitting a little wider on the shoulder. I think everyone was really trying to like push the limits that day because where I sit, I feel like I'm somewhat deep and uh, everyone was way deeper than I was. And I was like, I hope it doesn't look bad for the beach. Like I'm sitting on the shoulder or something, but uh, it worked in my favor. <laughs> Is it like maybe only on the bigger days like that, that those wide ones actually come or? Um, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily that it's that much wider. It's just, uh, when it is bigger, there is like a, there's a new, there's like the main boil when it's the 20 foot size, but then when it does go to the 20, 25 foot size, there's a, another boil that's just a little bit farther out and not quite as deep as the main boil but it's still right. Like it's a good entry line. Gotcha. Um, can you talk about your familiarity with Waimea? How long have you been surfing it? How many times a year do you surf it? All that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I surf Waimea fairly regularly. Uh, I mean, as regular as we get big swells, which is not all the time, but when we do, I'm, um, um, I don't really like to surf it in the 15 foot size because it is so crowded and that makes it that much more dangerous. I like to go to other places when it's around that size, but when it is the 20, 15 to 20 foot size, then it starts to kind of thin out the crowd. People are start to, people are a little more, uh, you, it's not so you can just paddle right out in a huge channel to get out when it's that size. You have to know what you're doing a little bit, yeah. which helps the crowd out. Um, so whenever it's that size, I'm pretty much always out there. Um, the first time I surfed Waimea, I was 13, I believe, 13 or 14, wow. and was on a 9-4 single fin. Okay. Tell me about the board you were riding on Sunday. On Sunday, I was riding a 10.0 four fin. It's a super brand board. I was sponsored by them for a few years. The board is about five years old, maybe six years old. But um, I'm not exactly sure who the shaper is. Gotcha. Um, one of the people that were under super brand. Right. Yeah, that board looks like it's been ridden a lot. Yeah, it's one of my go-tos when it gets big. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it looks like, I mean, I obviously in big surf like that, you want to be able to rely on your board, but 
with my normal short board, when it starts looking like that, I start getting off of it because it just loses some of its resilience, obviously, and just starts to feel dead. What's your experience with big wave boards? I mean, obviously you want to be able to depend on it, but is there a point where it becomes not dependable? Um, uh, it, uh, it's big wave boards are a little different. They're glass heavier. They're made a little stronger because the waves are, will break them to pieces if they're not. Yeah. Um, so they seem to last quite a while and do real good. Yeah. A Long, bit longer long, lifespan. Yeah. As long as they're, as long as they don't break or buckle, they stay gotcha. in good shape. <laughs> gotcha. Um, back to the course of the day, you're surfing heats and you're obviously coming in and working uh, in between your heats. <laughs> How did you celebrate that night after you found out that you won? What did you do that evening? Um, I went home and ate some pizza and went to sleep. I was worked. Uh, it was a long day for me. <laughs> and you had work the next day, right? Yep. Back to work the next day. Have you been able to enjoy any of it? Has it even sunk in? Um, it is definitely starting to sink in now. Um, my dad's birthday was actually the next day. So, oh my gosh, we went out, uh, Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday night, because I was off the following day. And we had a birthday dinner, a little celebration dinner with me, just my family. And we went to Ahi Limo and Haliva and had some really good food. And it was really good. Good. Um, the most poignant element of this story is the fact that you are a lifeguard. And obviously, Eddie uh, was a lifeguard at Waimea Bay, the first lifeguard on the North Shore. Do you know the iCal family personally? Um, yes, I'm good friends with iCal, Uncle Clyde's son. Okay. Uh, I'm too young to know Eddie personally, but I've yeah. heard the stories my whole childhood growing up. And what a good human being he was. He is a real life superhero. Uh, totally. From being the first lifeguard at Waimea Bay to having kind of a perfect record as what I've heard, never lost a life while he was on duty. Um, yeah, it's really, really inspiring. Where did you grow up? Uh, born and raised here on the North Shore. Okay. Uh, I've moved, all, moved all around here on the North Shore. How did your family end up there? Um, my dad kind of... He was into surfing. He lived, uh, his, my grandparents are from, um, Southern California. They're from like inland Southern California, Alpine area, Alpine and Corona. Yeah. Um, uh, he loved body surfing and longboarding and he would always go to the wedge, the wedge when he was little. And then when he was, I think he was 18 or so, he got a one-way ticket here with 50 bucks and hasn't left since. <laughs> what year or what uh, decade would that have been? Uh, he's born in 59, so in the early 70s. 70s yeah. yeah, early 70s. Insane. Yeah. And then and that's my mom, where you met your mom? Yep. My mom came here on a, she came here for like some sort of vacation and then she came back on her own and then ended up meeting my dad and been here ever since. <laughs> Amazing. A, fun, a real funny story, kind of like uh, what also inspired me to be a lifeguard is I wouldn't be here today without a lifeguard. He, uh, my um Go on, go on, go on. Uh, so yeah, my dad, my dad had met my mom at kind of just like a passing by. And then the next day my dad went out to surf, to handboard rock piles, body surf rock piles, pretty good sized day. He says, 
and he was uh went down pretty hard knocked unconscious and one of the lifeguards at rock piles pulled him out and saved his life if if it wasn't for that lifeguard he'd be dead oh my gosh and then after that he was all laid up at home after being in the hospital and he ended up calling my mom like because he had just met her and hey you want to come help me out and hang out and then that's how it happened (laughs) so their first date was her nursing him back to health yeah (laughs) amazing what a good wife yeah (laughs) it's a great quality um so when you were growing up on the north shore then did you have ambitions to be a pro surfer Yes, for sure. I think every little kid surfing out here does. Yeah. And it, did, it didn't work out so well for me, but uh, that's oh, why. I, why not? Because uh, um, I wasn't the best competitive surfer. I didn't do very good in the contest scene. And then when mm-hmm. I had my first child, I knew I needed something solid and something that so I could provide for my family. So I decided lifeguarding was an easy choice i was like was it get to uh continue my lifestyle of being on the beach and being able to be in the water and then also provide for my family so i was like that's what i want to do and i like to help people so that that worked out really good when was that when did you have the kid and when did you start lifeguarding my first son was born in 28 late 2018 and i started lifeguarding in january of 2019 gotcha um can you explain how water safety works for these events? Is Hawaiian Water Patrol the same as the North Shore lifeguards, or are there higher drivers and rescue crews that are not professional lifeguards? Um, most of the Hawaiian Water Patrol were are either lifeguards or former lifeguards, and they are the hired uh, water safety for um for the event but then the lifeguards are also there as well on the rescue units and then us on the beach so kind of work together as a team the water safety is like the main uh they're the first like the first keys that should be in there because they're hired for the event and when they get to shore they kind of transfer care to us if someone is really injured and then we move it on to uh the EMS and so on. Gotcha. But the Hawaiian water patrol who are working the events are not necessarily lifeguards at the time. They're sometimes former lifeguards. Yeah, they are current and former lifeguards, but okay. they, they are like, they're working that on their day off. Um, but they are, uh, they're all, really 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 good watermen can't say enough good things about them they are guard angels in the water they're like they're top water safety crew in the world i believe it's when you see it on the webcast like the claw grace uh rescue during the Dehui event yes i it's was insane actually, it, i was it's there insane. for that that's one of my best friends and i was on that case and it was really 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 scary seeing one of my good friends be down like that when you watch the rescues uh the rescue effort it's insane how good they are yeah it was such fast reaction timing it was like really 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 good yeah there's a second the yes one of the senators is here or someone in the state thing is here to give me a thing he's just dropping off a thing real fast Take your time. I'll edit it out. Okay. Um, We were just talking about Kala and his rescue and injury. How's he doing? Um, Kala's doing really good. He's uh, he's on the road to on the mend. He uh, he is he's a really strong, really really strong, good-hearted person, and his body's reacting really well to all the crazy trauma that he's had. But he is he's doing good. What was the injury or what were the injuries? Um, he drowned. So he had a lot of water and sand in his lungs. And then he had quite a few pretty bad cuts on his face from hitting whatever he hit, either the board or the reef. Um, 
but yeah, that was the main injuries was lung and face. Lung it and looked, face. It looked like his helmet came off from the wipeout on the wave, and then maybe the worst part of it came from the duck dive. Is that accurate? Yeah, so he, when he fell on the wave that he was riding, his uh, helmet came off, but he came up and he gave Nolan all a good signal. Like, tap your head if if you're ever in trouble or if you're ever in a bad situation, but you're okay, you can tap your head and the water safety knows you're all good. So he came up from that wave, did the all good signal, went under the next wave, went to duck dive the next wave and came up and broke his board. And then that one, he waved for help. I'm not sure if he was hurt then or if it was just because he broke his board and he wanted to get in to get another board to get back to the heat. And then the third wave, another surfer went off, uh, took off the uh, road, but that one was a pretty heavy closeout as well. And then that wave, Kala never came up from. And that was really, really, really scary. What's scary is to see how capable and how fit he is and for him still to be put in that situation or for you, the day you won, at the end of the day, when you're accepting the award, saying how scared you were, because yeah. I would be scared, but I see you guys and I'm like, I think that you're invincible, you know? So it's a quick reminder. Yeah. You definitely cannot think that when you're in the ocean, mother nature will slap you down as like no other she is always in control uh, <laughs> Hold on. uh always got to be humble and respectful and be thankful for what she gives you never never pushing too hard or else you will end up in a bad situation so kala should make a full recovery then yes he should good doing good um so can i ask you a little bit about what that guy I overheard some of that conversation. He was saying that there was some bill or something that changed that makes lifeguards liable. Yeah. So in 20, in 2017, I'm not sure what happened for it to be taken away, but the uh, liability of the, so the lifeguards before were covered. And if you rescued somebody and they think, Oh, you didn't do a good job. They could, they would, if they tried to sue you, they would have to sue the state or the city and county. In 2017, that bill was removed. So all the lifeguards became liable. If you did a rescue and the person didn't think you did a good enough job, they could sue you directly and take everything you had. Um, I'm not sure if that actually ever happened, but okay, is reintroducing the bill to get us our liability protection back that way we're not liable for we're not uh not having to worry about people's families coming after us directly for they think if they think we didn't do a good enough job that's insane that that would have gotten taken away yeah it's crazy that that happened but it did and really thankful that brenton awa is uh trying to reintroduce the bill hopefully the senate and state will pass it back through and get it back to keeping us covered yeah let this be a psa for anybody who's listening or within hawaii and can vote on this to get behind that effort because people are so litigious even if you did a phenomenal job and you rescue them people are they can sue still for anything yeah. so yeah yeah it's really really strange scary uh well let's talk a little bit about um it seems to me like the biggest threat for you doing your job lifeguarding, the biggest threat is people themselves, ignorant people who underestimate the power of the ocean, basically. And there's so many new surfers post COVID that we're seeing havoc in lineups around the world. Um, That's a joke we have in the towers, the COVID surfer. Totally. They learned, it's a real they, thing. They learn during COVID and they think they're ready to rule. <laughs> well, look, I've surfed for 30 years. I know my limitations. I would not even think about paddling out at pipe when it's, you know, anywhere near legit. But there was a video, there was an epic video last year of yeah, a couple of, of guys. Our, one of my coworkers snapping at some guys. Yeah. <laughs> it was and but it was perfect. It was like two guys who just by looking at the video, you could tell that they're not equipped to surf. Or was it at pipe? It was at pipe. It was about an eight foot, like a 
proper day at pipeline and they were going to paddle out on some nine foot nsps or eight six nsps which is everybody knows is not the board to have out there (laughs) no and so it was very clear that they were not qualified to be out there and so your friend the lifeguard was telling him very matter of factly that they weren't qualified and and directly and forcefully and kind of uh they needed to hear it essentially but i was just my question for you you is just what is the official policy when you see somebody paddling out that you know isn't qualified what is the policy for how to handle that uh we try to uh inform them of the risks and the dangers and we let them know that hey you're put not only putting yourself in serious danger but you're gonna put me in serious danger because i'm the one that has to come and save you and I would really appreciate it if you don't put me in that position because I'm here to warn you of it before you get there because we don't want to have to get to CPR on somebody that is like we that's what we really really try to prevent and that does happen accidents do happen like the best surfers in the world totally. some accidents accidents happen it's it's bound to and with like the game we play it's very heavy um but yeah the the ignorant or macho ego filled surfer that wants to go to the cool place because it is that place and i can surf it but they really know they can't they're not only putting themselves in danger they're putting everybody else in the lineup in danger and they're also putting the lifeguards in danger because we're going to have to be the ones to come save them. Exactly. Have you had to have that conversation with people telling them uh, that they're not qualified? Uh, quite a few times. Yeah. Most of the time it, it goes, most of the time it goes pretty good. And people they are just kind of clueless to like, Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll go somewhere else. But then there is the person that is, has a real big ego and thinks that they're, bigger than life and they can do whatever they want. That's the hard people to deal with. (laughs) Have you ever had that situation happen? And then that person need to be rescued? Um, yes, not necessarily for surfers, but just telling like swimmers, like, Hey, this is not the area to swim. We'll recommend a different beach. You can go here or there. And then you turn around 10 minutes later, you look out, you're like, oh my gosh, got to go grab this person now. They get stuck in the rip or they get sucked out past the waves and they can't get in. They're screaming for help. Uh, In that scenario, were they then humbled by the time you got them to the beach and apologetic? Yes, for sure. Good. They realized that like we weren't just doing it to be mean, that it was... We were serious about it. (laughs) Good. Um, Localism used to control a lot of that chaos. You know what I mean? And now it's like there's no localism creating order in the lineup or the threat of localism creating order in the lineup. So it really feels like a free for all, which puts the onus on the lifeguards, unfortunately. You know? Yeah, there still is a little bit, but with this day and age of social media and everything, thing is filmed and captured at some point somewhere somehow uh a lot of people are a lot of people don't want to risk their i don't know how to say it risk their uh risk their careers to keep it in order and then that person comes and sues them and takes everything they have exactly a lot of those people out there that are just ready at any moment that they can do whatever they want. And if somebody messes with them, they're going to sue them. Totally. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about fitness. What do you do in order to uh, remain capable to do the surfing that you do and the lifeguarding? Um, Yeah. So every lifeguard shift we have, we have a lunch break and a uh, either water patrol or training bake. So on one of my breaks, I'll do some kind of either go surf or do a little 
beach workout or something, run the beach or um, do stuff like that. And then in winter, in summertime, it's more so training for winter. And then wintertime, it's just surfing and staying in active, like keeping an active lifestyle that way. It keeps up because it's hard to, it's hard to walk away from waves to go train. (laughs) Totally. So are you actually spending time in the gym doing any weight training or anything like that? Um, I don't necessarily do so much weights. I do every once in a while. I like to do jujitsu. It's a really good, uh, mental game because being in the ocean is, yes, it's a lot of physical strength or like physical conditioning and stuff that you need for that but you also need the mental side as well because some of the most fit people i've seen in the world struggle in the tiniest waves because they don't have the mental and they don't know what is they don't have the knowledge and the mental uh awareness of what's going on and then they when you panic in the ocean that's when things go really bad yeah um what about diet? Is there anything that you avoid? Anything you avoid in your diet? Um, I try to eat a somewhat healthy. I I don't really do f- much fast food or anything like that. I, I do like my steak and potatoes, steak and rice and salad and fish and uh, just a fairly healthy diet. Just stay away from yeah. the fast food as much as I can unless I'm on the road traveling and do what I have to do to eat. <laughs> right. Um, you're 27, right? Yes. You'll have to worry more about diet 10 years from now than you do at the moment. (laughs) Yeah. Right now I try to eat as much as I can to put on weight and it's just not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more about the day of the event. Was that the biggest Waimea you've served? Um, in 2016, when the year that I got, that got me invited to the Eddie was, fairly similar size but that day was probably the most consistent biggest i've seen it like every other set seemed to be a closeout set or just about and condition the winds and the swell direction were really it all came together and made it really beautiful like yeah the it was really groomed. Sometimes when it gets really big like that, it gets, uh, there's kind of just so much water moving around in the bay that it is, uh, kind of a little bit out of control. Uh, people are still surfing, but it's not as, yeah. it's not as, uh, it's not as picturesque. It's a little yeah. more wild and really, yeah. but that day was very beautiful for pictures and looked looked as yeah. great as it could be. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do with the airline miles and the 10K? Um, I'm going to take the family to go see our grandparents in California. Nice. Yeah. That's a great usage. Yeah. <laughs> really stoked on that. I've been trying to figure out how to do that. And now I got the, the free flights and money to go see the grandparents and have a little bit of fun in California. <laughs> amazing i'm i thought for sure you were going to say surf trip but i like that answer better yeah now i gotta now i gotta figure out how to get some time off of work (laughs) um have you had any exciting opportunities since sunday um yeah there is some things happening uh it's there's a lot going on i'm still trying to process it all but there is some cool things happen and I see how they play out. (laughs) Have you received an invite to surf in the pipe pro? I have not yet. (laughs) Dude, it's such a failure. If they don't invite you, you earned it. Yeah. I really would love to surf in the pipe contest because I love surfing pipeline, but I really hate the crowd. (laughs) Yeah. The, The wave is dangerous enough as it is. And then when you have to get, extra aggressive to get your own wave it makes it even that much harder yeah. but surfing pipe with only three other guys out is a lot of fun 
it's still scary, but it's a lot of fun. The WSL will be blowing it if they don't invite you. Like, not only, I mean, I understand, like, they don't even acknowledge the Eddie because it's not their thing that they're sanctioning, sanctioning. Yep. but you got a 10 in an event that they were running, you know, like you've earned your way. They know who you are. They know what you're up to. I think that they should absolutely capitalize on this and invite you and give you a shot. Yeah, I would definitely take it if I can get the, the time off to surf the contest. <laughs> um, the uh, I know you can't exactly reveal exciting opportunities that have presented themselves, but are any of them directly related to maybe a pro surfing career? Um, I'm not quite sure yet because I am not really interested in chasing the contest scene. As I said before, it doesn't. It's not, I'm not the best contest surfer. It doesn't, it doesn't make me, I'm not, uh, how do I say this? It's not why I surf to compete. I surf for the love of it, to have fun and enjoy myself. And competing kind of takes that out of surfing for me. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll have to see what opportunities, what happens and the way it goes. But if they're looking, if the things are looking for me to try be on back on the tour and competing and all that stuff, uh, probably say no, but yeah. Um, yeah, I got to do what's best for my family and provide if, as best as possible. <laughs> if there was a sponsor that presented themselves that did not require you to compete, but allowed you to just free surf, would you consider putting your lifeguarding career on hold to pursue that? Um, it depends if it pays the bills and takes care of my family for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Good. So you would take it, take another shot at pro surfing if the circumstance yeah. was correct. Yeah. The life lifeguarding will always be here. Uh, it's what I love to do. And I'd be foolish not to take an opportunity like that. If, if it does present itself. Good. But, um, um what about, yeah. I and the other thing is your bosses, everybody at, Everybody in Hawaii would fully understand and support it. I feel, you know, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've seen some stuff on social media about people wanting to kind of go fund me some cash uh, to make up for the prize purse. You know, when John John won in 2016, it was a $75,000 prize purse this year. There's not a big sponsor for the event, so it's considerably yep. less, but there's online talk about GoFundMe will cover the Delta. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, I am very grateful for what I received. I'm super grateful for the Ikaohana to actually raise enough funds to, uh, to even put on the contest because it is such a big ordeal with what it does to the North Shore and the security and the scaffolding and all that stuff that they had to put on. So I'm super grateful for all that. Um, I'm not trying, I'm not asking for money. I don't, I really don't want to go fund me set up. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm happy with what I've received and there is some people supporting me elsewhere. So it's, I'm really grateful, but I'm not out here asking for money as well. Uh, if people did contribute to that. Would you get, would you accept the gift? Um, I would accept it, but I'm not asking for it. I don't want people to take their hard earned money that they've yeah. worked. Give it to me. Um, I feel, I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, people want to support you. I feel like, and almost this is like a learning experience. And I don't know if the I cows would, or the organizers of the event would consider it for next time. But for next time, they could even say in advance, if you're interested, throw 20 bucks into the pot and the winner takes all kind of a thing, you know, because a lot of the people that I talked to got so much thrill out of watching the event. They're like, dude, I would kick in some money. No questions asked, whether it's a pay-per-view or just a donation thing. Um, it was a thrilling day of surfing and people want you to want you to benefit from it, you know? Yeah, it always is. Uh, the two that I can remember is 2009 and 2016 being a little kid is like 
it's the biggest day in surfing there is. <laughs> I know. Was Greg Long 2009? I believe so. I believe it was Greg Long in 2009 and John John in 2016. I think it was 2004, was it? I think that was the year Bruce won. Maybe. But yeah, I don't have the list in front of me. That one, not so much. I remember a little bit, but I do remember 2009 and 2016. Yeah. Um, speaking of social media, why did you delete Instagram? Um, because I would get stuck on it and I too busy thinking of, oh, I could be here, could be there and not. So wasn't being as present with my kids as I needed to be. So I, I deleted it a few months ago couple months ago i deleted it about a year ago for about three months and then i really needed to get a hold of one of my friends one of my international friends and the only way i knew how to do it was through instagram so i reactivated it and then i was got in touch with him and then i got sucked back into the instagram rabbit hole <laughs> um i know i used to follow you and so when you won and i tried to search for you and you were gone the fact that you deleted it made me love you even more. <laughs> Cause I was uh, like, dude, you're killing it. You're killing life. We all want to delete it. We're just so attached that we can't. And so the fact that you did makes me love it even more. Yeah. I'm trying uh, with all of the stuff that's going on right now. There's so many people reaching out to friends or relatives or the lifeguard association or the iCal Foundation trying to get a hold of me. My girlfriend might be making an Instagram account with an email and stuff to get a hold of me, but I will not be running it or going on it. But it's just a way to contact me if people need to get a hold. <laughs> well, but, I encourage you to keep living the exact same lifestyle you have. Do not let this change you in any way. But if you can implement a manager, whether it's your girlfriend or an actual professional uh i really hope that you're able to leverage this to continue living the lifestyle that you are thank you thank you yeah that that would be really really cool <laughs> um whose boards are you riding currently um currently i just have all random old boards um at uh pipe swell about a month and a half ago i broke my only six four that i had and i actually broke my board and i came up and i was right next to griffin colapinto i was like hey you have any boards you want to sell or donate and he donated a couple boards to me so i'm super grateful thanks griffin he's uh he's the man <laughs> that's amazing what a story yeah super cool I was super stoked on that it was like it was right after christmas so it was a it was a christmas present <laughs> A couple of mayhems. Yeah, I was super, super stoked on that. So you don't have a specific shaper that you like working with? Um, no, I kind of just... Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of local shapers, Brett Morimoto here on the North Shore, Brett Board Hawaii. Yeah. He shaped real good boards. That's who I bought a quiver from last year. Or the winter before I had that. And those boards lasted about a year and then they're now broken. <laughs> so, but now that I got a little bit of money, I'm going to definitely order me a new, a new quiver. <laughs> Sweet. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say about that day? I mean, about um, the Eddie, about the Eddie, about the win, about the family, about the day itself has, I know it probably hasn't all sunk in, but. Yeah, I would just like to thank the Ica Ohana for putting on such a magical event. Uh, I would like to thank my family and friends for supporting me and everything that I do. Uh, I would like to thank Hawaiian Water Patrol for being there and being the guardian angels. And also like to thank Ocean Safety for all the good work they do around the islands, keeping everyone safe. And uh, yeah. Just thank you, everybody. Thank all, thank everyone for the support and all the congratulations. It, it means the world to me. Yeah. Like I said, when we started, 
it really it almost feels like a Disney movie in a sense because it does feel like a win for the community. Like surfing has gotten and the way that the WSL kind of runs things, it feels so far removed from the act of surfing itself. They're running events in the wave pool or crappy beach breaks or whatever that and there's million dollar athletes and it's all great. Like it serves a lot of people make good living off of it and all that's And that's great, but it's so far removed from surfing as I know it. And so to see the story develop the way that it did on Sunday and to see you emerge felt like the people's champ. It was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like the story that we needed in surfing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, the way the WSL is running things, they are trying to make it, uh, seems like they're trying to make it like the NFL or something. And that's not what surfing was kind of created to be the outcast thing, you know, like that's how it started back in the days, people getting away and going out in the water and having fun and surfing. And now it is yeah. like the, like a mainstream, uh, mainstream sport and yeah back in well, the day all my, favorite, all my favorite surfers back in the day were kind of the outcasts <laughs> well yeah and i think the success of this event too is just focusing on good waves you know like that should always be the focus of any event is put it in great surf and uh everything else kind of falls into place if you do that i think but yeah. what i loved about again, at the very beginning, asking you if the lifeguarding was a distraction that day and you saying, no, it's actually helped me kind of surf without overly focusing on that. Because yeah, I think uh, what could be a better almost uh, qualification for surfing something like Waimea than lifeguarding and having ocean knowledge and ocean awareness and all that sort of stuff. So it really does feel like the most equipped person one day, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, so. it's uh, it was really cool. It kept my mind off the contest, and I wouldn't say I'm the most equipped. I don't have the all the top of the line gear, but I'm definitely there all the time. So <laughs> good. Well, again, congratulations. I know you're super busy this week, so I appreciate you carving out the time to do this. Well, thank you, thank you again, David. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, hoping to see all of this stuff develop into a lot of opportunity for you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Me, too. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the day with the family. Thank you. Have a good day, you too.